Hi, I'm Derek Nipanak, and I'm going to provide a little bit of an overview as to why the uh, road to Niagara is important and why we need to have this discussion now and begin a discussion about the nation-to-nation -nation relationship and what it might look like, as well as some of the impetus as to why this, this discussion is important in this day and age. And part of, part of this discussion has to start with recognizing foundational principles of treaty, foundational principles of respect and relationship building that may have been found in the 1764 Treaty of Niagara. I'm going to fast forward, however, from 1764, when we originally agreed to treaty, when we lived as original people within the freedoms of who we are, we lived under natural laws from the original instructions we received as the original people, taking care of the land, taking care of everybody within our communities, and living truly as nations who took care of one another within the diplomatic environment of the time. That's the conditions that existed in 1764. I'm going to fast forward to 1867 and the creation of Canada's Constitution. Under Canada's Constitution, it broke down into Section 91 and Section 92 as two distinct heads of government. Section 91 covered federal powers, Section 92 covers provincial powers. Okay? Under Section 9124, what was created was a head of power that we call Indians and Lands Reserved for Indians. Under Section 9124 was created the Indian Act. The Indian Act in 1876 was created as a consolidation of pre-existing colonial legislation. By the time 1876 rolled around, the intent of the legislation was to terminate the idea of Indians and lands reserved for Indians. That was the motivation at the time. In 1876, when this act was created, <coughs> there was already a number of people who had been excluded from being recognized as original people. That process continued with this 1876 manifestation. Today, under Section 6 of this Indian Act, are the provisions for creating a status Indian. Now, when you want to become a status Indian, you actually have to fill out a piece of paper, and you have to send it into the bureaucracy of the Department of Indigenous Affairs, where the documentation is reviewed by a bureaucrat sitting in a, in a quiet, closed office somewhere in Gatineau, Quebec. Now, I've heard this many times before, but it is fundamental to the existence of a nation for a nation to determine who its members are. So if we're filling out paperwork and sending it to Gatineau, Quebec, for somebody to make a determination under Section 6 of the Indian Act whether or not that person is part of a community, that to me is not nationhood. So this is one of the biggest questions we need to ask ourselves as to whether or not Section 6 is an appropriate uh, containment uh, container for identifying who a status Indian is. That is one of the pieces that we need to put on the table. And I do believe that the intent of Section 6 is to keep a definable limit on who can be defined as a status Indian. Now in today's comprehensive claims processes, they're, they're maintaining this power within the Indian Act head, within, the, within Section 9124, to determine who's, a, who's going to be a status Indian. And I do believe that the intent behind containing people within that, within that legal fiction is to manage costs, as well as to provide for the commodification of the indigenous person. Because once you can clearly define who the status Indian is, you can then assign a number to that status Indian. And all people that carry a status Indian card are assigned a number, and they're assigned a band. And successive generations, under the provisions of Section 6, people are falling off the band list. Today we have children and grandchildren who are being born, and they're falling off the band list. Okay, they're falling off the Indian Register because they're not qualifying under Section 6, 6.1 or 6.2 exclusions. Now for many years people have been taking this matter to court. They've been taking it uh, all the way up to the Supreme Court, spending millions of dollars to keep us identified as status Indians. But is that really something we need to do? Because what happened to the original intent of treaty in 1764? The principles of treaty identified in 1764 also surfaced in the treaties out in the West, Treaty 1 to 11, also operate from these fundamental principles. But what we haven't done is we have not defined our original freedoms. Although there's been statements said that we recognize and affirm existing Aboriginal rights in today's Constitution, we have not for ourselves identified clearly and articulated clearly what our treaty rights are, what our treaty freedoms are within the context of this Canadian colonial superstructure that was created to keep us contained within the Indian Act box. Okay, Fast forward to 1982. 
1982, Canada's Constitution created Section 35. Within Section 35 is a recognition and affirmation of existing Aboriginal treaty rights. Okay, so what we've done in 1982 was cr we created a line of continuity that goes all the way back to the original founding principles of treaty, which tied to the Royal Proclamation of 1763, which binds the Crown to any future treaty relationship, and it binds the Crown to act honorably in dealings with existing Aboriginal treaty rights. So today, when you hear Indigenous leadership who are under treaty talking about the Governor General or the responsibilities of the Crown, it's because there's a golden thread that ties all the way back to the early treaties to today. So in 1982, when Section 35 was created, Section 35 identified that Canada's Aboriginal people include the Indian, the Métis, and the Inuit. However, <clears throat> the question remains as to who that Indian is under Section 35. The Indian under Section 35 cannot be the creature of statute that was created under the Indian Act. It has to be something different than what's been created under the Indian Act system. The Section 35 Indian remains to be defined. And it was put on the table as, as an exercise and a discussion in the 1980s. There was a series of constitutional conferences which put on the table the question of self-government. The institution of self-government can exist but first we have to define who that Indian is. And that's going to take each and every one of us. Each and every one of us has to engage that idea from beyond the institutions, from beyond notions of, of job titles, whether you're a chief or a counselor or a grand chief. You have to be a person first. And we have to define as people who this Indian is in Section 35. That is the realization, I believe, of who we can be going forward. That is the purpose of a reconciliation framework. That is the purpose of ensuring and providing a way for our young people and our future generations to determine who they are within this Canadian landscape. And I believe that's the unfinished business that was left from the 1980s. That's the unfinished business that's spoken of time and time again from previous leaders. And that's the unfinished business that this new federal government under Justin Trudeau is going to have to put on the table and, uh, and work with us towards uh, the solutions. So that is some of the context around why we need to have this discussion today. We have an entire generation of young people that have grown up since 1982 that have been forced to go into this Section 6 uh, status Indian uh, container without, without the recognition of who they are within their original freedoms, without a recognition of how important it is to work from fundamentals of treaty. And it, are, it is our responsibility now to put this on the table as a serious and substantive matter that needs to be addressed in this generation. Miigwech.